What I wanted to do today is to give you some ideas of what we were thinking uh, in our career portal project as I was leaving Northwestern University. We were launching this project to better address the career needs of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. And really what we were trying to do is um, assess where we were as an institution in terms of graduate student placement by broad field category or, or here it would be called by division. We were interested in expanding career outcome categories for students because as you'll see in most surveys and nationally there are limited categories, academic, postdoc, government, industry, other. And we all know there are more, many more career opportunities um, and you can parse out those limited categories even further. And importantly, we were uh, interested in identifying cross-field across career competencies. That is, what would complement your research training to allow you to survey the broad array of career possibilities and be prepared for any one of those that you might choose um, and be prepared for multiple career pos possibilities in case your, your um, career trajectory changes over the course of your graduate um, student time at the institution. We were also aware of challenges um, both at the institution and nationally in implementing such a career development uh, and professional development um, program. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the project we embarked upon and I'm gonna bring in teaching and I'm gonna give you the punchline right now. Teaching is an essential, very essential cross-field, cross-career competency um, and I'm gonna Try to tie that all together at the end um, to make it applicable to this conversation. And so at Northwestern University, we, were, we track, as do uh, most in institutions across the country, our graduate student placement. But as I mentioned, we, we lump those into four areas. Academic at the bottom, uh, oops, um, postdoctoral or additional training, um, industry, government, uh, and then other. And so as you can see over 10 years, really, if you look at the blue bars for academic and the red bars in the far right for industry and the lighter blue bars in the middle for um, postdoctoral or additional training, it doesn't fluctuate much year to year. But when you break that down by individual um, broad field categories or divisional areas, this first slide in that uh, breakdown shows arts and humanities where most of the graduates go into the um, academic um, pathway and if you look at the social and behavioral sciences again m most of those um, graduates go into academic tracks some go into postdocs very few go into industry if you look at the life sciences many go into postdocs as we all know it's a necessary step in the current funding scheme um, as as an apprenticeship model in order to continue on to the um, academic or even industry um, research tracks. And if you look at the physical sciences, mathematical sci sciences, and engineering, you see a much bigger percentage of graduates go into, on the right-hand side in the uh, red color, um, go into industry positions. So we looked at this even further, and we asked the question, if we broke those categories out into more real-life um, categories, what would that look like? So on the left-hand side in this stacked bar, you look at PhD students are graduates. And we broke this out into careers in finance, government or nonprofit, academic, industry, postdoc, writing careers, consulting, law, um, and then tenure track careers. Um, that was a little bit different than the academic in the sense that those we categorized those as smaller non-research one institutions where you did primarily teaching and then there were non-tenure track um, opportunities as well. And so you see again, most of the students, uh, most of the graduates go into a postdoc and then in the middle, cat, middle column, what you see is that when you look at postdocs, most of those postdocs are in academic situations um, and those postdocs that go to academia as a second career um, posting 
go into a, either another postdoc or a tenure track position. Um, some go into non-tenure positions. And again, this list on the right-hand side in the legend doesn't, again, doesn't account for all of the career possibilities. So what this data doesn't tell you, and what most institutions do not tell you um, when you apply to those institutions as a graduate student, is what are the career trajectories and pathways beyond first placement? And so what we, show, what we showed at Northwestern on our website and what, we, what many institutions do is first placement. And that does not give you an ac accurate picture of the career trajectory of an individual as they traverse um, the various interests that they have and encounter the possibilities that they do um, as their career is developing. So this is taken from um, the University of Michigan. The Rackham Graduate School has really done a good job at a longitudinal survey for all of their graduate programs. So um, on the left-hand side, they show a various, the, the various career categories. And again, this is not a complete listing. Um, the next column shows um, the first placement. The next column shows placement uh, five years after graduation. And then the next column shows 10 years after graduation. And what you can see in the first column the first placement is that most, and this is in biological chemistry uh, program, most of those um, first placements are postdocs, and that's no surprise to anyone here. If you look in the middle column, you'll see a smaller number of postdocs five years out, and then that tells you that those graduates are now pursuing career paths, and, and those are broadening. If you look 10 years out, that number of postdocs is even smaller yet. So I think what we have to do as institutions, we have to start longitudinally tracking and um, categorizing career placement and career outcomes. And there is a national effort through the Council of Graduate Schools to do just that so that we can all institution to institution compare apples to apples. And, it, and, and that will help us better prepare our students for the broad possibility um, of career outcomes. So the project we started, uh, just as I was leaving in the last, um, actually started at the beginning of January of this year, was an idea to map core competencies to career paths. So the first thing we did is we um, appointed a graduate student as our higher education uh, leadership career intern. And so what that person was interested in doing, and this person had a passion for um, the idea of broadening career possibilities, although this student, this, this student is going to end up in a tenure track position, as I've been recently told. Um, but she was really interested in giving us a list of all the possible career um, outcomes that our students have encountered over a number of years. And that's what's shown on the right-hand side of this slide. And we broke those down and we listed those as academic or teaching research positions, advertising, marketing, communication, publishing, consulting, um, e-learning and educational or instructional design, uh, entrepreneurial careers, finance, government policy, et cetera. Um, and what we were interested in doing is identifying core competencies that would prepare a graduate student for any one of those poss career possibilities on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, we listed out the um, core competencies. And I want to emphasize, though, that these are in parallel to the research training that the various PhD programs, mentors, faculty members um, provide. And that is critical. It's critical that graduate students are all in in their research and they develop the critical thinking skills. They develop the ability to ask the important questions, to think about how you answer those questions. That's absolutely critical. Our, work for, our national workforce lags behind our um, international peers in having the percentage of PhD students in the workforce overall asking these important questions. And so we need that ability in our workforce going forward of providing thought leaders for the next generation, providing leaders in, in the various areas of these career paths that I show on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side are these competencies, leadership and management. 
And in the small print, I don't expect anyone to, um, to be able to read that. I just robbed this from the Northwestern website. Um, and the second one, speaking and presenting. Writing and research, of course, uh, is a competency. I would emphasize writing there. Career exploration, the ability to look at the career um, landscape and decide what direction you want to go as an individual. And then at the bottom, and this is not least of all, but in fact, what I want to emphasize for the rest of the talk is teaching. So at Northwestern University, we had a center called the Cyril Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, I, they might have changed their name now, I can't remember. Um, but that center was housed in the provost office, but received considerable graduate school support. And it really benefited graduate students and their training in teaching. And so this is a figure that they used to have on their website. They don't have it there anymore, but I happen to have it um, in some document that, that I um, unburied. And what this shows really is the various opportunities for graduate students to participate in different elements of teaching training, gain additional experience in teaching. Because it, the requirement at Northwestern University was graduate students only had to, for their degree, complete one quarter of being a, a TA. So they went to TA for one quarter. We were on the quarter system. And that's not sufficient introduction, training, and experience in teaching to become uh, proficient at, at the art and at the, the practice. And so the Cyril Center really innovated and launched a number of different programs. So if you look at the very top on the left-hand side, is the basic thing that most all graduate students attended, and that's the new TA conference. That is essentially just an introduction on TA, best TA practices, um, how to approach the classroom, whether it be a discussion session, a laboratory, uh, small groups, um, et cetera. There wasn't really any um, insight into how to design a curriculum. Um, the idea of a flipping a classroom or blended learning was not introduced at that time. That, that happens in some of these other areas, the graduate workshops, the discipline-specific projects, the teaching certificate program. Um, and then students could become, on the lower right-hand side, graduate teaching mentors, graduate teaching fellows, or serial graduate assistants. And all of the arrows on this figure are important because if you look at the lower right-hand side, all of those arrows feed back into the other um, entities that are offered by the Cyril Center. Meaning, if a graduate student, I think I brought my pointer. So if a graduate student participated here, they actually interacted with students participating in this program. If a graduate student participated as a graduate teaching fellow, they also interacted in all of these other programs. So not only were they exposed to the new content, the new experience in those, in those more specialized programs, they gained additional experience by interacting with new TAs and with graduate students that were less experienced in teaching as they were learning to develop their teaching um, skills. And so this formulated a concept at Northwestern University of really emphasizing teaching as an art, but as a science as well. And so in the middle, You'll see, you, you see Sirtle at Northwestern. And I had the pleasure in um, participating in my first um, Sirtle um, conference or symposium this past April at Texas A&M where I first met Bob. And it's amazing that the institutions across the country have come together and formed this network that really advances um, teaching as the central focus for development of one's thoughts, research, ideas, and how that can propagate forward in helping you become a better scholar, a better person in finance, a better person in publishing, a better person in uh, law, and IP, patent law, et cetera. So I just want to briefly introduce um, a couple ideas uh, a couple of the programs. The new teaching assistant conference I mentioned. This is an all day training session for new teaching assistants. It was not a requirement, but huge attendance. 
TA workshop leader. These were groups of graduate students represented the, who represented the department and they implemented the TA conference workshops. They brought their experiences as TAs to the new TAs. And then I, I have some quotes uh, on the bottom and I can make any of this available to anyone who wants. Teaching certificate program was very popular because this is the program where graduate students could develop their own teaching portfolio. They could actually partner with an institution outside of Northwestern. So we had Northeastern Illinois University. We had a number of smaller universities around Chicago where our graduate students would go and develop their own course and teach at these other institutions and become relatively independent teachers. So it, it required those individuals to really gather um, their ideas on teaching, what was important in the subject matter they were teaching, synthesize and crystallize that all together and be able to deliver that in an independent manner to undergraduates at different institutions. And then I mentioned briefly the graduate teaching fellows were involved in a lot of the other Cyril Center activities, um, as were the graduate teaching mentors. And so back to this um, idea of all of these programs to support teaching and in the center CERTL. And I put that, that was put, I didn't put that in the center, but it was put in the center because it is central um, to the overall functioning and improvement of all of the programs that were offered under the Cyril Center. And that is teaching as research. And I think that's not a foreign concept among this group. And so Cyril called their Cyril Teaching as Research, or STAR. It's a classroom-based research initiative designed to improve learning and teaching in the STEM plus um, disciplines. And so these were participants drawn from the other programs that I showed on the previous slide. And these individuals actually developed a research project out of the teaching that they did. And so this is um, Northwestern's version of Delta. And it was, it's relatively infantile compared to what happens here. But it's along the same lines. So I want to go back to this idea of teaching as a core competency. So we develop, when we were developing our ideas around core competencies that were necessary for a broad career landing, we developed this idea as a wheel. There are, there are different competencies. You go around the wheel. You may attain some of them or all of them. And teaching was one of those part, one of the part of the wheel. But I would argue that teaching should be central to the core competencies. So teaching draws from all of those other core competencies, but it also contributes to all those other core competencies. So if you are a faculty member in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, and you're asked to teach medical students, so you have to know the subject matter, you have to be able to communicate it effectively, you have to be able to engage the audience, and you have to know whether or not the material you are transmitting to that audience is actually being transmitted. So you have to assess your teaching. So those are all elements of the other competencies, the writing, the speaking, leadership. As a teacher, as a faculty member, you are a leader in the classroom, in the laboratory, on campus, in the library, in all of the um, settings as a faculty member. Um, you have to know a lot about career landings. And so I think the changing landscape as mentors is to develop these core competencies ourselves and be able to deliver those to graduate students and postdocs so that they are better prepared, you are better prepared for the broad possibility of career outcomes. And I'm gonna end there by acknowledging uh, Cheryl Berriman, who was our in, uh, inaugural higher education leadership intern who did a lot of the, the legwork in, in assembling the core competency ideas, the career outcomes, and then the great staff that was at the graduate school um, when I was at Northwestern, and then Nancy Regeri, who was the um, Cyril Center Director for our graduate programs. So I'll stop there and uh, we'll continue on with the program. So the next part of our program um, is a chance for you to 
um, engage in some discussions around um, the remarks that um, Dean Karpus just made. Uh, many of you guys expect graduate students to spend uh, full time in the lab. So where does the time come uh, for graduate students to participate in uh, growing professional development in a way that you guys will support that? If you look at the OMB clarification for federal funded research and setting, graduate students are supposed to be able to do things that are encapsulated in graduate education. The advisor or the grant holder is supposed to allow a student to do that. So I, I urge everyone to really take to heart the IDP, the Individual Development Plan idea. Have a two-way conversation with your advisors that um, is always dynamic. It's not, this is not a static thing. You don't meet with them once and say, I want to go into intellectual property. How do I get there? And they give you some hints and they're popular. I think you have to talk continuously with your mentors. And I think you should develop a mentoring team as well that helps you think about how to integrate all of these things to be the most successful in every aspect. So I'm dancing around your question because your question is a little direct. If you have an advisor that says you need to be in the lab you know, 100% of the time, um, that's an unrealistic expectation on their part. But I think you have to have a discussion. I think my, my direct answer will be have a discussion with that person and say, however, these other things are important for career development. Um, and I always told my students, or the students I advised at Northwestern, is that you, know, you need to, to form or utilize faculty committee to help you um, develop yourself and develop your career. So it's not just one person making a decision for you. It's a conversation amongst the mentoring team. And as I go along and I talk to my colleagues, I say these things too. And it's up to the leadership of institutions to really talk to the faculty and, and convince them of the importance of um, having, having students having the ability to particip participate in these educational opportunities. We have to somehow convince the faculty that the reality is that this is an educational experience and that you need to participate in those. Uh, we really like the slide you have and the teaching as the central core <laughs> competency. Um, no, no, seriously, we do. And um, <laughs> the reason we did is, but we react to that in the sense that uh, if that truly is the case and that we do really believe that, um, how does that actually get valued in practice when it comes to supporting TA professional development and more specifically TA compensation? Not to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but currently is the way things are on this campus is you're achieving senior TA status at a higher pay scale based upon being a dissertator and having one and two third semesters of teaching experience. But as we all know, you know, the investment we make here at the Delta program to better our own teaching practices hopefully contributes to a better you know, future teaching possibilities, but also benefits our students now. Um, and students here are, are hopefully better off for TAs making a voluntary investment of their time. And so my question is, what are ways that the university can financially and like, in any other way support TA professional development outside of our own voluntary commitments? The institution, uh, you know, in leadership, like Bob's leadership, going after NSF money to develop ideas of health teaching, uh, help the concept of teaching as research, uh, and, and aggregate better teaching uh, overall across the university, better uh, advances as graduate students, and it certainly helps um, educate undergraduates. So I think those types of things, I think the, the smaller commitments that the individual units put into um, graduate school, put some um, resources in, almost office may or may not, I don't know. Uh, I've been here long enough to understand the budget that well. But, um, so I think that's where we, as leaders of the university, can um, impact teaching and provide that professional development for you. Another thing that we talked about at this table that kind of relates to some of the things we're talking about here is um, the idea of having program requirements require you to do something related to career development. So the microbiology program, for example, recently um, added this 
career development requirement where you have to do something to uh, help further your career opportunities. So you can take a law course, you can take a business uh, a course like the law school or the business school. You can do an internship with an industry. But we were just talking about here how much easier it would be to be able to go to your advisor and say, I have to fulfill this requirement. And this is what I think I want to do for my career. What do you think about me doing an internship here or me taking this course? And I think it helps another way in addition to the IEP to like get that conversation rolling. So as much as the programs can sort of step in and advocate for the students, I think that's another major step to take. The Ohio State University does things like that too, um, where there's professional career development and minors that their graduate students On this table, um, talk about mainly lack of uh, institutional or structured uh, professional development resources. For example, um, in electrical engineering, for example, there, there's basically not much uh, professional development opportunities at all. Um, in other department, uh, other groups, uh, what is happening is mostly a, you know, maybe a luncheon once or twice, or once or once a week or once every other week that they get to meet uh, somebody from the industry and they tell their career path, and, and that's mainly what it is. So, and the other part we talked about is similar to the first question, is that what gets emphasized here is research. So. If you want to go to a tenure or a research university like UW Madison, what matters is, when it comes to tenure time, what matters is research here and teaching here. And that essentially enforces what you want to focus on. If you want to end up at teaching at UW Madison, it's better to spend your time doing good research and publish more and publish more and publish more. And don't worry about the teaching because at the end of the day, when it comes to your time, that doesn't matter at all. One can do research and be an excel at research and still interject some teaching uh, and still develop as a teacher. I think it can be done. So it's not an either or uh, at this institution or any other institution. I think it's um, all of us collectively have to find creative ways to make that happen. Some of us want to be involved more in teaching than others. And so I think those that want to do that have to find creative ways to do that. And this is one program that, that enables that uh, and helps that. Um, so I don't think it's a one size fits all for everyone, but I you know there's there's some truth to what you're saying is that research is there's a lot of truth to research is important. Uh, <coughs> teaching often does take a, a backseat to research at research more institutions, such as UW Madison. Uh, but it's up to the individual to really seek out these types of groups, faculty mentors, mentoring teams that can help enable the more progression as a teacher. How you can utilize teaching to assist your career development, whether that be uh, in primarily research, whether it be in any other areas. The goal would be also for a faculty member at a research university like this to also be good at teaching. And maybe that's not, you know, in the hiring process that's not prioritized, but if you're ultimately choosing between two equal individuals and one also has shown evidence of excellent teaching, they might get the job. So right now maybe it's not a requirement, but let's try to make it a requirement. One way to do that is by training teacher, these researchers to also be good teachers. So the College of Engineering for UTA, they have NEO, New Educator Orientation, and TIP, Teaching Improvement Program. I was a grad assistant who helped organize these programs. It was once a year before the semester started. Two days for a new UTA, one day of professional development. The goal was professional development to enhance grad students' kind of life as TA and future teachers, future researchers, future academians. When will other schools and colleges kind of or will they be? And it's always a struggle because it's funding that to lead into going to presenting these presentations. But I think those are two great avenues that we can get, like some kind of formal professional development for TAs or graduate students. And will that trickle down to other schools and colleges on campus? Is that something that you want to? Whether that is going to happen centrally, um, I'm not sure. 
So I know at the request of the provost's office, um, it's the serial center that I mentioned is in the provost's office, and so it happened centrally there. But there were also additional layers in the schools and colleges there as well. So I don't know if that structure could be replicated here or not. Um, I'm, I certainly advocate for it, but um, I can't promise it. And then, of course, Letters and Science has GA training for um, their uh, students, and that's about half of the TAs on, on campus. But I think it would be um, really powerful to have it made more uh, concrete for when you're TAing um, for a course to get that just-in-time advice from the faculty that you're working with and to be able to provide the structure to support that so that happens and happens consistently would be another way to move that forward and sideways. So I was uh, looking for you to make any comment or opinion on how TA does not necessarily mean you gain teaching experience, especially depending on what courses you TA. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts or opinions on how to hold programs either more responsible for making sure that TA does entail teaching experience or how you can make a distinction to make sure that students that want teaching experience get that opportunity. My intent of showing what we did at Northwestern, especially the Serial Center, the various options, really the underlying idea was that that, that institution had recognized that TA in general did provide teaching training. So exactly what you're saying. And so centrally that was uh, many years ago the Serial Center was born and um, they developed those programs that would enhance. Now I should, I didn't put the number of students that participated in each of those on an annual basis and it is quite small. So the ability to ramp up uh, and serve a bigger number is, is a constriction point. I think, and even Northwestern has not dealt with that adequately. Um, and so how would we deal with that here? So I think, I have heard uh, rumblings about um, a more centralized approach to this, but I, you know, I'm not sure where that is. Um, so I don't have a direct answer of how we would do it here, but I would, I would agree with what I think you're saying is that different differential type of program needs to happen to be available to students to learn how to teach in the best ways to, uh, you know, I mentioned flipping classrooms and uh, blended deliveries and things like that. And one does not learn that when you're thrust into a TA assignment on day one. And I'll, I'll acknowledge that. Uh, so how do we get from that point being thrown into the fire um, to a point where you're actually given, you're actually trained or given an education in the different teaching modalities and things like that. And so I can say though, I've seen some proposals from uh, continuing studies on some of these um, online program development certificates, et cetera, that are, that are going to come down the pipe where this type of professional development is, is addressed. Now, what we're doing in graduate school is trying to make it, trying to negotiate the ability of current students to participate in our current graduate students to participate in that type of programming that is intended to be revenue generated. Um, so we're we're trying to get to that place. Yeah, I agree. A lot of graduate students share that they um, are kind of lacking authentic teaching experiences, and so. I think um, students are finding ways, and it would be good for us to have a conversation about how they are approaching their outreach activities or other activities in a way that translates. So it will help them make that bridge to um, being a TA to actually being you know, in front of a class. I think it would be worth us pursuing that. Finding some of the opportunities that exist already, because sort of, I asked, was asked to mention about sort of this just-in-time teaching sort of mentoring, right? You just TA a lab class, something horrible happened, something wonderful happened, whatever, and sort of talking about it with somebody else. I mean, there are some programs and courses that deal with that. In this science, we do a science of teaching for TAs course, which is designed to be alongside your first teaching experience at the campus. Both Delta and this science and numerous other things do a lot of 
um, different things where you can actually develop materials and you can develop a whole course, things like that, that are much more authentic teaching experiences than a TA job where you're Maybe they're facilitating a discussion, maybe you're just there making sure the students don't burn a building down. You know. um, so I, mean, I think there are opportunities there. Maybe it's getting that information out to grad students and postdocs as a whole, program as a whole, things of that nature, so that you get more people who are interested in it actually in the things. Is our communication um, penetrates amongst our constituency high enough that it really makes a difference? And I, you know, I get numbers on click through rates and things like that of what we said about, but that doesn't really, you know, I'm not convinced that we're really reaching everyone with the information that each of you as an individual wants. So we've been talking about that and how do we address that. It's something that's on my radar. Uh, I'd like to have a graduate student app where we can push information, where you can decide what information you want to push to you. It's the other one has a whole of life stories. My mother does, so I don't know why. Instead of trying to make great researchers, great teachers, you know, it's very difficult to multitask, to be great at both things. Why can't we just have a person whose sole job is to teach, teach a bunch of courses, but still make the salary that the researchers get and have that protection? instead of trying to force people who don't want to teach to become better teachers? Do you think we'll ever get to that point? No institution will award a PhD without a significant new knowledge production. Um, uh, I mean, after we went through the traditional grad school process, we get our degrees, but apply for a job to become just a teacher at, say, UW Medicine, where our job is to teach three or four courses and not do any research, but have that protection that researchers have with tenure. That does exist. People are hired straight out of graduate school to get into teaching positions. With their tenure track positions, yes. That research? Uh, not every social Yeah, that, that may not happen. Because the, the definition of a research institution is that it does research. And so um, I can imagine that faculty, you know, in order to remain number four of research expenditures in the country here, we have to have faculty. A great number of faculty have to do research as well. So I think you put all of that in the mix, you're never going to get into a situation where the institution, a, a leading edge research institution, is hiring a significant proportion of the faculty uh, to solely teach because of the mission of the institution. There are, but I want to say, there are institutions where graduates straight out of their PhD can and can your track teaching positions. There is, Harvard, for example, has what are known as professors with practice. And University of California, San Diego, has just started professors of the practice. It's an odd phrase for they teach. That's, that's, <laughs> that's their job. Um, and they aren't fully tenured, but they are long-term contracts. Or if you, when you're hired for that, the expectation is that that's, that you will be staying there. Uh, and then here, we have faculty, some of you have probably been taught by Tim Balser and Michelle Wadio, uh, who were hired and in order to do research in education, in the departments. So there are paths at research universities, but perhaps not quite the division that you're describing. Yeah, I'd like to bring our, our uh, career competency program here, I'd like to establish something like that, uh, where we can centrally, so, so really where, what that was, what that entailed was a cataloging of all of the departmental and school and college based activities. And then looking at what are the career landing and career outcomes, and then determining what one would need to be competent in to be able to 
uh, be competitive for a number of those career landings, and then determine what wasn't provided, and then centrally we would provide that. But it, but it, because um, we were very decentralized as well in uh, Northwest, and a lot of things happened in schools and colleges um, on their own. But we, and we don't want to duplicate unnecessarily. So that I would like to do. I'd like to catalog what happens. This is a scaled up model here. Um, graduate school is one of twice as big as is there. Um, so it would require us cataloging and then reaching out to the various providers of those opportunities to coordinate and then to determine where the holes are and fill those holes. One thing that my hinder a student's ability to get teaching experience is because their advisor is trying to create a mini me. Um, so I guess my question is, have you noticed or is there any sort of movement either within our university at Northwestern or across the country that might help to redefine success post-PhD that is other than that R1 faculty position? There was a lot of discussion about which career outcomes would be considered a success. And there's a lot of consensus among my colleagues across the country that all of those things I put up on the right hand side of that one slide should be considered success. Now, the key is convincing my faculty colleagues that all of those are equal successes. That's where the work has to come in. That's not going to change overnight. I, be honest with you, but I think from a leadership point of view, as, as, at the top of the hill, we can work on uh, introducing that concept of these career outcomes being successful. And I think where this is amongst our, our peers, our media peers, the University of Michigan comes to, to mind. And that's one of the reasons why I showed that, that longitudinal survey snapshot from their web page is that they consider internally at the Rackham graduate schools those as being career successes. And they have worked with their faculty and have begun the dialogue and, and conversations that say those are successes. So I think we're getting some steam built up nationally. And um, in December, the Council of Graduate Schools is going to launch their survey tool, their longitudinal career survey tool for all CGS uh, member institutions. So CGS is going to accumulate all of this data and then they distribute it nationally. And so we will be able to see where we sit amongst uh, our AEU peers and non-AEU peers, publics, privates, small schools, big schools, etc. cetera. Uh, and that puts additional, um, I don't want to use the pressure, but I word pressure, but that's all right, there's pressure on our colleagues to really reflect on the fact that these are career successes.